Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing what the another database model, vector databases, explained. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note this Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and chat sections, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and mastery data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. William, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you, Shannon, and welcome everybody. As I get my screen up here. There it is, okay. All right, here we go. Now, sometimes uh, sometimes you get things right. And about September, when I put my topics together for the year for this series, I had been watching the incubation of vector databases for about a couple of years, and we were starting to use them in earnest. And I felt like about May, uh, I want you to know more about vector databases. And it has turned into a very hot topic. I am also honored that you have decided to join me uh, to learn about this topic when there are alternatives. So I talked about, or I put in the title, what the, another database model, vector databases explain. Don't we have enough database models already? Well, first let me, let me talk about what is a database model, at least to me, how I'm using the term, is it's a, it's a new data type or types that necessitate uh, either a significant addition to existing databases or a new field or set of databases entirely. And that is what we're seeing here. We, we, we have vector databases that are add-ons to existing databases, and they're called vector databases, by the way, as well. Uh, and then we have a, a vector database field emerging uh, right underneath our, our feet, if as it were. So uh, vector databases go back to about 2018, uh, that's when the first came out, and it was pretty rudimentary. And I, I suppose we'll look back a year from now and think the same thing about where we are right now with vector databases, because they're still kind of emerging. I would say they really weren't ready for prime time use until 2023 and maybe even 2024, depending upon your maturity. So here we are. Let's learn about vector databases. Uh, first, uh, a little bit about us. This is a set of technologies that we are proficient in, that we've used in the field, that we've used in our benchmarks, et cetera. You want to get with a consultancy that has deep experience in your technologies and a strong business acumen. And if that consultancy is not available, give us a call. Um, that's how we get a lot of our business. It's okay. Um, let's move on. These are the topics of the year. And we are here. We are here in May. This is to let you know what all the other topics are. The past topics are available uh, for viewing. And the future ones obviously come back next month and the following month every time, uh, every month at the same time. This is how I measure the years passing. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to believe every time that we're another month in when I look at this. So, well... If you, if, you, if you think that that would uh, uh, alarm you, what about this? Look at the big technology ways. And the reason I put this up here now is because I am putting generative AI in here. I think it's that big. It's as big as these other major things that happened in technology over the course of 
time, obviously, back to 1440 with the printing press, which kind of started it all, in my view, anyway. And then we moved along to the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, the computer. Yeah, the computer. It came along when I was in high school. I don't know about you. Uh, there was this big old computer in a freezing room in the back. And we brought our offering of punch cards to the computer and and uh, set our alms or whatever and just hoped everything worked out. We, we know in an hour. Uh, and it obviously improved since then uh, to the transistor, the integrated circuit, and so on. And so on. A Rapinet, that is the, the early internet that was developed by the Department of Defense. And that served as the foundation for the internet that we have today. It's an interesting story. Uh, definitely uh, know that. Uh, and then we moved on to personal computers. The internet mobile cloud, that brings us to generative AI. Each innovation built upon the previous one, <clears throat> leading to a more interconnected and information-driven world. Now, the way we see it is that AI is the next big leap in technology evolution. And so in the 90s, we saw the internet, we saw mobile, we saw, and then in the early 2010s, cloud computing, I see Gen AI as being the next big wave. And this was kind of mostly clearly demonstrated with the performance and growth of ChatGPT. Simply put, the time it took for ChatGPT to reach a million users was very impressive and staggering. And it beat everything else ever. And it drove people all over the world to take notice and start thinking about this in a much more serious way than they had before. It's the fastest growing app of all time. And we see AI in everything that we do. I take briefings, I take investor pitches, I talk to enterprises, everything is AI, and for good reason. I'm not saying it's wrong. It is for good reason. It is that impactful on everything that we do. Now, I will admit there's a bit of what we'll call AI washing going on, where it's not really AI, of, or at least not very mature AI that's happening out there, yet we're calling things AI. So buyer beware for sure when you're moving into this space. Now, I'm going to start here. Uh, at a kind of uh, maybe unusual place, uh, but stay with me. Uh, this is the relational database data page. I'm going to kind of build it out here. We've got a page header and footer. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but we add a couple records. We've got the row IDs at the end of the page that point to the offsets. That's important to know. And that works hand in hand with your indexes, which in the index uh, entries, it is the page, no uh, page number and the row ID number. That's the key and the ID. And so that tells you where to go get the rest of the record because the index is usually a subset of the columns that are in the record. So here we go, let's add another one, voila. There is our third record on the page. Depending upon the size of the page and the record, you can put perhaps dozens of records, perhaps hundreds of records on a page, on whatever you call a page, which is ultimately the unit of IL. So this is the granddaddy of database storage. As you can see, it allows for great random access to anything in here. You can get there quickly. You don't have to start reading at the top of the page and, and look for what you're looking for. You can go to the row ID. And now, uh, let me add in here a little twist since I'm on the topic, the column database. And so many analytical databases are columnar these days. And all that means is that there's no row IDs, everything's fixed length, but it's only one or a small set of columns that are on the page. And so they're all, they're obviously, since they're fixed length, at predictable offsets from the beginning of the page. So you might go to offset 10 to get record number one, you might go to offset 20 to get record number two, and so on and so forth. It's all math. But when you add up all of the column storage, you get the row. So it allows us to deal with less than the full row. It allows us to get more of what we want in our IO. So that's the column database, all right? It's kind of a twist on what we see here, but there's no one size fits all. This does not work for everything. And so along came no SQL, right? And I'm gonna put, the reason I'm talking about it is I'm gonna put vector databases into this category as well. For decades, relational databases were the default. As workloads scaled out, new models were required. Database types exploded. So we have document, we have search, we have streams, and the databases 
evolved as well. And so all the things you see on here were kind of the, the pillars of that movement. Uh, JSON is a data model potentially, relaxed ACID, uh, because that consistency level uh, being immediate would crush uh, different workloads that we're doing out there now with big data. And so we learned to balance all these factors out. And we there's a so there's a different point in the balancing of all of the factors in a database where this made sense. And it, it gave a, a programmers a lot of freedoms. Now, what we're seeing now is a convergence of the different schema types in NoSQL to what we call multimodal. And let me build this slide out. Here you see the four different major types of NoSQL database. And like I said, they're kind of merging up now into a multi into multimodal approaches. So that's one of the one of the few pockets, I guess, in everything that's going on in data where things are getting merged. And next month, by the way, the topic will be multimodal databases. So you want to be sure to come back for that and learn more about this particular area right here. So you got graph real quick. You got graph, complex data, not necessarily big data size. You got column stores. Uh, you got document stores, which is mostly JSON type stores, and then key value, which is high performance, uh, but but kind of brute force performance, not a lot of workload complexity necessary. Many data types are covered by this paradigm, web crawlers, open link data, JSON, as I mentioned, XML, and so on and so forth. Uh, web crawler, that's an internet bot, which systemically browses the internet, typically for the purpose of web index. And then you got log files on here as well. That's pretty big. Log files are, they, they list actions that have occurred. So web servers maintain log files, listing every request that's made to the server. With log file analysis tools, it's possible to get a good idea of where visitors are coming from. I'm talking about a website here, how often they return and how they navigate through a site. And databases are multimodal when they can be any of these, like in the example that's shown here, key value store and a document store. So there's a lot of things to look for. We'll talk about it more next month, but you're looking for things quickly like a single copy of data, not, not having to form that data multiple ways, uh, but able to interpret or interpret it in multiple ways. So JSON flattening without data explosion, universal indexes, things like that. So into this fray, of NoSQL comes vector databases. So again, I'm talking about vector databases. Uh, when you have a database like an Oracle or a Mongo that has added vector capabilities, they call themselves a vector database. So you don't have to be just a standalone, that's all you do in order to be called a vector database out there in the market. And then you have, you definitely have standalone databases like Pinecone, that that's what they do. They are a, just strictly a vector database. So they're also obviously vector databases. Now, I don't know if you caught the Oracle 23 AI announcement from last week, but this was front and center. This was the big deal around that release, what they're doing with vector. So it's interesting, check that out. In data types over the last decade plus, we've got all these new sort of categories emerging. Vector is the most recent of these, and it might be the biggest uh, when all is said and done. As we saw with the NoSQL generation in databases, Vector has emerged to solve new problems, or I shouldn't say problems, new opportunities, opportunities that we didn't have before as a business. But with the technology, now we do. And it's incumbent upon us who know what we can do to now actually do it for our businesses. So definitely bring the the learnings from here and everywhere you're learning about vector databases to your organization and make some things happen. So we can have machine representations of data sets like image, voice, text, or even molecular structures. Machine learning and LLMs, large language models, are transforming vertical use cases in enterprises and individual consumer use cases. Traditional databases struggle to handle imprecise comparative questions such as which items are similar. And this leads me to imprecise search. The struggle of imprecise search. Have you ever tried to search for something but you didn't quite have the words for it? 
I know I do. <laughs> or do you remember some characters in a movie, but you can't remember the name of the movie? Or if you're like me, you can't remember either. I'm good at most Jeopardy categories, but definitely not pop culture. So have you ever tried to find more shoes that look like the one that you had back in the day, or maybe the ones on your feet right now, but you don't know how to search for it? Are you using LLMs that don't have the most current information? If you answered yes to any of these questions, vector search is what you're looking for. Now, before we go further, let's put this in context of all the things going on out there and all the terms you're hearing. All right, you're hearing about Gen AI. I said it was the big trend. That's the big trend here. Okay, so Gen AI, these are AI models that can create new data like text code or images. Um, LLMs are a type of Gen AI that focus on text. So Gen AI, you're talking here about OpenAI, uh, Google AI, Jasper, Shortly AI, the, they are known for their LLMs. And so that brings us to the next bullet, LLMs, large language models. These are AI models trained on massive amounts of text data. They can generate text, translate languages, write different kinds of creative content, etc. And LLM examples are like GPT-3 or GPT-4, just came out, uh, Lambda, um, NVIDIA, Megatron, Turing, uh, there are others. Okay, and that brings us to where we are today, here today. Vector databases. These are a special kind of database designed to store and search for information represented as vectors. And we'll get into this. So uh, let me move on though. Ret retrieval augmented generation RAG. Kind of a weird saying, right? But this is a technique that combines LLMs with vector databases. The LLM will receive the prompt. The RAG system uses the vector database to find similar information. And the LLM uses the retrieved information to improve its understanding of the context and get a more accurate and relevant response to you. So imagine the LLM as a writer, okay? Or you, you're the writer, you're an LLM, right? The vector database is like a giant reference library. RAG helps the writer by finding the relevant books from the library to improve their writing. You can't just start with book A and start you know, looking at every one of them, right? It's like you need a librarian. Overall vector databases provide the factual backbone. LLMs handle the creative generation and RAG bridges the gap between them, leading to more informative and reliable Gen AI applications. AI vector search augments Gen AI by retrieving detailed, often private content that's needed to answer your questions. That's what RAG is. And this will all flesh out as we go along here, but I wanted to set that context because people are getting confused by all these new terms being thrown at them. Now, databases are adding vector support. I would say probably your main database is adding vector support in one way, shape or form because they have to um, these days. Th there's a number of reasons that demand AI technology in general. Vector use cases are very broad and limited, really only by customer imagination. So I guess I should say quite unlimited. What can you do with this? As with any analytical database vector, effectiveness is tied to the underlying data. And I have definitely seen companies get, uh, how shall I say, put the, uh, get, a, get ahead of their shoes um, by not having their data in place and having their data be effective for Gen AI. The data must be effective for Gen AI. It must be accessible, it must be well-performing. It must be relatable. Uh, it must be cataloged or otherwise organized. Yeah, the data layer is still quite important in this. So each new data layer is a potential roadblock for accuracy and efficiency. And developers are already swamped by an abundance of interfaces. Their preference is not for more individual silos, tools that they need these days for more broadly capable platforms, oftentimes it's just for more capabilities. And sometimes that takes the form of what your favorite database is adding uh, for vector support. So in essence, databases need vector support to keep pace with the evolving needs of AI and developers. So make sure you, you, you know that story for yours. Now let's talk about vector search because this is where it all kind of the understanding comes together, I think. 
So you're searching based on meaning, not just keywords. You're leveraging machine learning models called encoders. The vector search is the capability of searching based on meaning. This employs machine learning models called encoders to transform text, audio, images, all kinds of data into high dimensional vectors. Vectors are also referred to as embeddings. And they are essentially a high dimensional array of numbers that captures the semantic meaning of a word, a phrase, or even an entire sentence. So what you see there bolded on the slide, that's what a vector looks like. To a human, it's nonsensical, but to AI, it's knowledge. So imagine a car hunting app that helps customers find cars for sale that are similar to a picture the customer uploads. Finding a good match requires combining semantic picture search with searches on data, including customer data, you know, good old relational data, customer data, such as location, preference, and budget, product data, such as inventory, location, price, stuff like this. So you do want to see it come together, uh, the relational side and the vector side. So what are vectors? Vectors are used for encoding data, and they're typically... They're typically, by the way, not larger than the original data itself. Now, I've looked at several models, uh, OpenAI's most prominently. I've looked at how they encode things. I'm starting to form some, some ideas <laughs> about how it all works. Now, the, the different models will encode different ways. That's why you can't mix and match, at least not yet. Langchain um helps with this but we'll get to that um but does the encoder put a single word into a floating point number or does it put two words or a phrase well yes and no they all do it a little bit differently think about it if if you encode a full sentence into one floating point number you're not going to have as much you, it's going to be quick, but you're not going to have as much meaning in that. You're not going to be able to do as much with it. And so usually it's a pair of words, maybe a word that ends up in a floating point number. And But, but that's sort of a general statement. Again, I'm not really ready to talk about how OpenAI does it or any of them does it for that matter. But I'm starting to, I'm starting to see that uh, this is the case. Anyway, you see the various sentences here or phrases. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. To be or not to be, that's a question. They all form a different set of floating point numbers. And I wanted to quickly cover what these vectors are. So you need to understand them before you can make use of them. There are the, a numeric representation of data and its related context. If you take a simple example like these strings here, it becomes vectors, which is the array of floating point numbers that you see. The words are inside of the strings, the letters and everything that's visible there. So everything is reduced, if you will, to numbers. Think about it. That's how a computer works. It has to be that way. You can imagine this would be an extremely powerful concept representing all of this information with just a string of numbers. And so probably the first question you have is, how do you produce these vectors? I, I've alluded to OpenAI, and there are different ones, uh, Cohere, Google Vertex, Hugging Face. You produce uh, vector embeddings by sending data through what's called an embedding model, right? And this is a machine learning model that you can get from OpenAI or any of these that you see here. It turns your data into vectors. And the way it works is you take some of the set of unstructured data and you send it through the model and it returns an embedding to you. Really, this whole vector space is not that it's not that uh, confusing. It's not that difficult. It's just, just reduce everything to numbers and then deal with it there. But there are some things to know about it, like Word2Vec. Word2Vec is a technique that some of them may use to represent words as numerical vectors, capturing the semantic meaning and relationships. It's trained on large text data sets and learns meaning based upon the surrounding words. Similar words, have similar vector representations, meaning the numbers are not that far apart. Word, and by the way, um, 
if you're thinking like I do about this, the 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 the, the number of floating point numbers in a vector, it's it's always the same. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Word to vec embeddings are used in recommendation systems, machine translation, chatbots. It's simply, I shouldn't say simply, but it is looking for numbers that are similar in different vectors. Word to vec assigns a unique code to each word or set of words, helping machines translate languages like a super dictionary, recommending similar products online. Like if you bought a book, it might recommend other books with similar codes and meanings. Same for a car, same for music, same for shoes, same for a house. Answering your questions based upon the meaning of words in your question. So bringing it to more of an enterprise basis, you're looking for similar enterprises that might be interested in taking up your offer. You're looking for similar products to suggest to a buyer who has shown interest in a certain type of project or product. So there's a lot of power in this, a lot of power in similarity search. These vectors can then be searched through to find similar content based upon multiple vectors being near one another in a high dimensional space. How many dimensions? I don't know, a thousand, depends. There could be thousands, really. And it's, it's almost impossible to represent that, right? I can do 2D, uh, but I can't do a thousand D. Uh, that's not even in my head. Um, so that's how complex that it gets, well beyond human abilities here, right? And this can be a great complement to our tr traditional keyword-based search techniques, but it's also seeing an explosion of excitement because of its ability to enhance the capabilities of LLMs by providing knowledge outside of what the LLM knows in search use cases. So, I mean, you can't go to ChatGPT and say, uh, well, show me show me our best customers or show me products that look like this product in our set of products, okay? You have to customize that by embedding your data and maybe or maybe not adding it to the LLM. So the queries that you run are in, ending up uh, going against the uh, vector. Vector databases do other normal database functions. This is kind of an oh, by the way, um, yeah, they're, they're databases, right? Uh, Pinecone is a database. It will partition or shard vector indexes for improved performance and transparently scale vector processing across the computers in a rack cluster if that's what you have with full data consistency. So here is where my limitation of a 2D slide comes in uh, to kind of bite me and, and, uh, and make it uh, hard to share with you the power of this because we're talking about thousands of dimensions and I'm showing you two here. Vectors that are produced from similar data will form clusters in space. And so this is kind of a simplistic way of looking at what we mean by clustering and what is really kind of crucial about vectors that makes them so useful. So we have, it looks like we have countries, we have animals, we have food uh, that have kind of formed into different clusters. And by the way, I've made this up. I'm no expert on, you know, <laughs> how to put these all together, but hopefully you get the idea here. And so, you know, I will just uh, kind of call them out here that this is a 2D description of vectors. And what we're really talking about is these very high dimensional vectors. And this is just an easier way to visualize it, but it's important to remember that we're talking about thousands of connections for these new capabilities that become really interesting. So, I mean, sit there and think about it. If you have a thousand attributes for countries, how how do you go about determining how close a country is to another when you got a thousand parameters to look at? Well, that's what that's what we do here with similarity functions. Um, there are different similarity functions. And I love it when our industry lets me geek out a little bit on history. Uh, you, you, <laughs> Euclidean, Euclidean um, is a uh, is one of those that uh, is named after uh, his, an historical figure, Euclid, and he was an ancient Greek mathematician, and he was considered the father of geometry back in 3000, 300 BC or thereabouts. Uh, he lived, so that was probably a little side you didn't need to know, but uh, I enjoyed learning about it. <laughs> So let's compare the three common similarity functions used in various machine learning 
and data science applications. Euclidean distance, cosine similarity, and dot product. Uh, I must admit, I have the most experience with Euclidean distance, okay? These functions measure how similar two data points are. It, it solves that problem I just mentioned of, you got a thousand attributes. How do you compare them? It's crucial for tasks like recommendation systems, nearest neighbor searches, and anomaly detection. So the higher the Euclidean distance, the less similar the data points are considered to be. So, okay, the Euclidean algorithm is repeatedly performing long division between two numbers. And when the method stops, the remainder will be the greatest common divisor. So the concept of Euclidean distance, that plays a role in measuring similarity between data points in these databases. So you think about, uh, you know, hyper dimensional space and you have different points in there and it's we're trying to get at the algorithm for determining the closeness of a couple of different uh, data points well not a couple probably many we're trying to get the nearest neighbors around those points because we're looking for similarity uh, cosine similarity takes a different approach instead of measuring the straight line distance and considers the angle between two data points represented as vectors Cosine similarity focuses on the direction of these vectors rather than their magnitude. And finally, dot product considers how many of each item you have, the magnitude, and if you have the same items. So if you care about, say, the predominance of, simi of, of similarity that you see, uh, as you want that to play in, and so you're going to get more common phrases out of an LLM that does similarity because it's considering magnitude. That's a dot product. But Euclidean, where anytime it finds a connection, be it vague, be it only one out of you know 10,000, it's still going to make that connection. And so you're going to get more nuanced results out of something that is Euclidean. At least that's the theory behind it. Euclidean distance ideal for numerical data when the actual distance between points matter and cosine is well suited for categorical data or high dimensional spaces where the direction matters more than the magnitude and dot product as i just mentioned is useful when the magnitude of the data points holds significance the choice depends on your data and the application euclidean distance is good for Numerical distance, where you care about those actual the actual distance between points, uh, that's what I've used, and uh, it's working out pretty pretty good for some of the applications that I'll mention a little bit later. You don't typically select the similarity function directly within your code, by the way. That choice happens during the design phase of your machine learning project, or when selecting the algorithms within libraries or tools. So vector search. Once you have that concept, I just mentioned that there has to be a way to determine the closeness of the vectors. You can then take advantage of vector search. So what vector search allows you to do is to search through data to find relevant results by utilizing the distance between the two high dimensional vectors. It relies on machine learning models to convert your data into the vectors. And then at query time, calculating the distance between the vector for the thing you're looking for and all of the vectors that you've stored, everything around it. And that's the core of what vector search is. Good vector search enables searches on business data to be combined with semantic searches on unstructured data, such as in this example here. So in this example, we are trying to find houses that look like a house for sale uh, or, or any house, a picture of a house. So I'm looking out the window, I'm looking at that house, I'm thinking, hmm, I'd like to buy a house like that, but it's, that one's not for sale. Let me take a picture of it. So what happens is we vectorize the picture and we vectorize all houses that are for sale and probably all houses for that matter. And then we're looking for which ones are close after you do that very complicated function that you do of determining similarity. So the sequel shouldn't be very uh, uh, different from what you're used to. Select from house for sale. There's a relational predicate where price is less than the budget and city is in the city. Okay, those are just relational predicates, but here's what's new. Order by 
vector distance. So what this is going to do is show you houses uh, in order of the closeness of that house to the picture that you gave it. So this sorts the search results based on how similar each house is to a reference set of features. The vector distance, this is a custom function that calculates the distance between two vectors. House vectors, this represents a column in the house for sale table combining or containing vector data that describes each house's features. Like, if you know, the number of bedrooms, the size, the amenities, and so on. Think about all of the attributes of a house. There are thousands, right, if you could get into it. The input vector, this represents a reference vector containing the customer's ideal house specifications. It's likely provided as an input parameter to the query. So this query you see here, and by the way, all the databases are a little different. I'm not saying this is the only way or the way that your database is going to do it. It combines customer data, product data, and AI search in five lines of SQL, a single integrated solution with all the data fully consistent. So I don't know. To me, seeing this query really cemented what vector search is all about. And by the way, I had to put this in here somewhere because um, I've been asked about it. Vector databases and graph databases, are they, or do we now not need to need graph databases? Because there's some overlap here, right? Graph databases utilize graph traversal techniques to discover associations between nodes. Vector databases use algorithms like K nearest neighbor, which is going to be my next slide, to locate comparable vectors. So graph databases excel in handling complex relationships. Um, I have a whole a webinar on them. Uh, I think there's a, a, a kind of a Venn diagram of overlap, but I don't think the overlap's very big right now. As a matter of fact, I am still recommending to most enterprises that they need both. They need both. And I think that these two spaces will converge. I think there's a lot of power in, in converging these spaces, but that's probably not going to happen uh, for some years. But watch this space. But for now, yeah, graph database is still in the mix, even though we have this. We have this thing doing K nearest neighbor. This is the closest thing to exact search for vectors. It finds the perfect nearest neighbors. So despite not being an exact search, it's a powerful approach to data analysis. By leveraging the wisdom of its closest neighbors, KNN unveils valuable insights and predictions. So imagine you're at a giant party and you want to find people who are most like you. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, how about in musical taste, in style, in activities, in dress, in career, and probably so on and so forth, right? K nearest neighbors is like an app that helps you find the people at the party. Imagine everyone has a special code that describes them. This code called a vector considers things like musical taste, style, hobbies, all the things that you know make you you, right? You're the new person at the party and the app analyzes you. You walk in the room, you're analyzed and the app scans everyone else and finds the closest people <laughs> based on how similar their codes are to yours. And the K is the number of parameters that you throw into this algorithm. It's the number you choose beforehand, like, like five. The bigger the number, the longer it's going to take, the more precise it might be. But then you would have had to have collected all that data ahead of time. So it's always these trade-offs that you're making. The app might miss someone who likes the same obscure band as you because their overall code, including style and hobbies, might be different. If you choose a small K like two, you're going to miss other people who share some interests. So there you go, K nearest neighbor. Now, this is a different one. Hierarchical navigable small world is an indexing technique. And they and both KNN and HNSW aim to find the data points in a data set that are most similar, that, that, that are the nearest neighbors to a given query point. It prioritizes speed over perfect accuracy. There is a point at which these algorithms say, that's good enough, that's close enough, let me return it, let me not spend another 2x time hammering out the very fine details and probably not, but maybe 1% chance I might find a different nearest neighbor for you, okay? It doesn't do that. 
Um, it does these hierarchical navigable small world indexing strategy. Um, Pinecone does HNSW, for example, not KNN. Imagine you're at a giant library with millions of books and you need to find a specific book. HNSW is a special technique used to find similar things in giant data sets, kind of like a librarian. It maps the data. HNSW can jump to areas of the map where similar things are likely to be found. Once it gets close, it does a more detailed search. So it might not find the perfect match every time, and that's sort of a theme of this whole space, but it will find something very similar. So now let's talk about use cases. Now, there are a bunch of questions. I, I flooded my slide here with questions I couldn't stop. There are so many questions that can be answered by vectors most effectively, as opposed to doing it, and I've done this. I've done this the hard way in relational databases. Um, I have um, approached <laughs> this whole way of doing things by codifying things in the past, codifying text in the past, but I didn't quite take it forward into creating the vector space. Maybe I should have, but um, we, we may have, uh, a lot of us may have done things like that, right? But that's hard and that's almost impossible. And really today, it's really almost impossible to do it the hard way. Why would you? You would use a vector search. So what kind of questions can vectors, an vectors answer? What's the difference? And the answer is that it can answer literally an infinite number of questions. I can use a relational database to find out your bank balance, but with a vector database, it's more complicated, difficult, and those types of questions. So what are the most similar images to a given image? So you supply an image, it will go out and query that. It has the ability to return images based upon the mathematical representation of the images. It's broken down and says, these are the most similar images. We see this in biopharma. They're asking, what is the most similar drug structure to a given example? Again, a lot of data there. In audio, Spotify does this, right? What audio files match this particular voice, uh, this particular tone of the song, and so on and so forth. So in, in government, they're beginning to use the vector database technology to analytically ask questions like, what counties in the U.S. are the most similar in population at the birth rate level, at the education level, et cetera? Vector technology is increasingly being applied to these vague, comparative, very complicated questions to answer. Uh, now, these are some general applications for most industries. Most all of us will have most of these needs in our organization. So it can be useful in a variety of contexts such as natural language processing and recommendation systems. Some of the more common ones that we're, we seem to all be doing is chatbots, marketing personalization, uh, summarization of product reviews and so on, and autoresponders. Yeah, that's all vector. General questions for certain industries. Yeah, this is more specialized. You may or may not have these needs. Some of them are healthcare oriented, life science oriented food. These are the most common uses right now. Um, now let's take, let's break something down here. You've learned a lot here today. Let's talk about fraud. How does this work? So number one, convert the financial transactions into numerical representations called embeddings or vectors using word to vec to create the embeddings. It's kind of like when, when you show up at the party, everybody in the party has already been vectorized. So it, we, we already know about them. We don't know about you. So you want to uh, take any new transaction and convert it into an embedding and query the vector index to identify transactions in the index with the most similar embeddings to the new transaction. And the reason you're doing this is because one form of fraud is to run the same transaction from different points in the world at the exact same time and hope that you get away with it. Okay, that's just one form, right? Now, what did I miss in there? Using the indexing tool HNSW to efficiently organize the transaction embeddings in a high dimensional space. And then we get into the, when the new transaction occurs, you convert it. Based upon a, a predefined threshold for similarity, the system can then trigger alerts for suspicious transactions. So if it's, 
99% similar, maybe you wanna know about that. If it's 95, maybe you don't wanna know about that. That's just coincidence, okay? So there's all that that goes into it as well, all that thought. So applications of vector search within the company, this is most companies. Most companies are gonna have most of this and all of this really is potential for vector search, uh, improving it. And a lot of HR stuff in here, by the way. And a lot of things like, I don't know, grading automation, individualized feedback to the staff. AI, now here in Texas, AI is evaluating approximately 75% of the essay responses on the STAR test, which is a standardized high school achievement exam. Imagine that. And that, I said high school, K through 12. Um, now, imagine that it's AI grading, probably AI. <laughs> um, anyway, that's what it's come to. I actually posted a research paper today, which I came across and found interesting. I posted it on my LinkedIn. It's called, is GPT-4 a good data analyst? And the results might amaze you. The results suggest GPT-4 can be a valuable tool for data analysts but it cannot currently replace them entirely. Um, I would like more stronger language around that, but uh, it is coming and we should be aware that GPT-4 and so forth are being considered data analysts. Other uh, applications of vector search in the com company that's very popular, logistics, transportation routes, warehouse workflows and networks to minimize costs. Now, I have some predictions here for us before we move into the how we can analyze vector databases. Uh, I think this there's going to be huge integration into our U.S. daily routines, email, online search, personal assistance. We're going to see a lot of that. And it's all Gen AI and LLM. As LLMs become more democratized, we're going to see most organizations go that route. There will still be some huge players in models, as I've mentioned. But in general, most suppliers will fine tune smaller models targeted towards specific sectors. So we'll get more customization, if you will, of the models and use cases. I see a future with thousands of smaller language models operating at the company or departmental level and providing hyper-customized insights based on the employee or need. I see a future where the hallucination problem will largely be solved. I see a future with the emergence of multimodal LLMs where you can mix and match your audio, video, picture, text, all in similarity searches. I see a future with a lot of technology like LangChain, which allows users to feed the results of one LLM into another LLM and get the best of both worlds. Now, the projects that I see I see right now, in terms of projects companies are doing, about 25 to 30% have a meaningful Gen AI component. Now, most of these projects today are small pilots, and I've mentioned some of the areas that they might be in, and the Gen AI components may constitute only up to 10, 20% of the ROI of that project, at least that's today. But many of these projects are being funded by Microsoft and Databricks and others because they want to see this happen. They have a vested interest, you might say. Gen AI powered chatbots, document understanding and document search form the bulk of our use cases. And by the way, in case you're wondering about, well, what, what do the courts have to say about this? A US court may rule in the near future that Gen AI models trained on the internet represent a violation of copyright. However, I believe a middle ground will be achieved that will not paralyze the Gen AI industry. So if you're, for whatever reason, hoping that that puts the brakes on things, I do not do not see it. It has never happened. Now, we had the opportunity to benchmark a couple of vector databases. And so we put some thought into how to do that. And I'm going to share that with you here right now so that you can do this because you do want to pick the best vector database for you. Now, the critical dimensions of vector database performance, throughput, latency, F1 recall and relevance, and TCO. For F1 recall, you want to see about 90% plus. And 
this is, it measures the database performance in returning relevant results. So it's kind of a combination here of the, of the other. So first of all, I'm, I'm jumping around here. First of all, throughput. It involves generating vectors and labels, inserting them into the databases and executing queries to measure performance. Our queries were of various types, such as nearest neighbor, range, KNN classification, KNN regression and vector clustering. So I'm gonna move along here due to time, but uh, you want a data set. And these are some of the great uh, open data sets that you can find. We used these, we used all of them. Uh, Glove 25 is pretty interesting. That's the first one shown there. It's a pre-trained word embedding data set developed by Stanford University. It represents words as vectors, capturing their meaning and relationships based upon their co-occurrence in a massive text corpus containing 25, that's a 25, dimensional word vectors. Now, it's always best to use your own data, but if you don't have, you know, your own data sitting around that makes sense for this, here are some data sets for you to think about. We had two work notes, liveness and relevancy. Liveness was creating an empty table and, and storage attached index on AstroDB, which happened to be one of them uh, that we compared, and an empty pod on Pinecone, which happened to be the other one, loading and ingesting one of the previously defined data sets and immediately following up with a battery of such queries. Now we use NoSQL Bench v5, which is an open source project freely available on GitHub with NoSQL Bench 5. Workloads are specified by YAML files. So for Pinecrone, for example, the approach to use their API, you drop any existing index, you create a new table, an SAI index, uh, you index the data set, you search the vectors. And that's all that is similar to some of the things that I talked about here today. Now, according to Pinecone, increasing the number of replicas provides more throughput and greater availability. So for TCO with Pinecone, you pay the same amount for a replica as you do for the primary pod. You always wanna watch out for your TCO, right? So thus a pod with replicas of two would cost twice as much. So it would need to provide twice as much value in order to justify the cost, right? Okay, that just makes sense. Indexing performance. So we tested things, we tested the time to index, we tested queries while the data set was being indexed. People will overlook that, but that is important as well. The largest data set we tested was Deep 1B. That has 96 dimensions and nearly 10 million vectors. And that took over four hours to index on one of them. So just to kind of give you a sense of how long it takes to index and re-index these vectors can be hours. Not only does raw and just an index performance matter, but so does how active indexing affects query performance. Search performance and recall, the accuracy. We saw a difference in performance during active indexing and after indexing completed. After indexing, the performance was much better. However, during active indexing, we saw queries come back with response times well over a second and up to 15 times slower. And these were simple search queries. What I wanna point out here on the slide is the F1 score. I kind of glossed over it a little bit ago, but there's the formula for it. It combines the, the search performance and the recall accuracy into a single metric which provides a more comprehensive picture of the retrieval system's performance. So a higher F1 score indicates a better retrieval system. It means the system is returning relevant results accurately and comprehensively. And finally, the CE CFO, and probably everybody, <laughs> will care about the TCO. All right, you have to make numerous assumptions. We made these assumptions. I'm sharing them with you here, not because you should make the same assumptions, but because you should see what goes into your thought process when you're testing vector databases. What time period are you looking at? The dimensionality of your data set, the cardinality, the average queries per second, the right size, and the attached index size. And your, your results may vary for sure. We tested three scenarios, a new data set every month, a continuous new data set every week, or near real-time data ingest. So which profile are you? Are you the profile that's going to add a new data set every month to your LLM? Are you 
having continuous new data sets every week or do you want real time? Well, you're going to have to make that decision uh, as you go forward in your vector journey. So in summary, and this is a good summary, so hang with me here. The concept behind vector databases, it's really simple. Assume your company possesses an extensive collection of text documents, which it does. You want to develop a chatbot capable of responding to inquiries, which you do, right? Uh, you do not want the chatbot to have to read every document to do so. So you store the documents in a vector database. It's optimal for this where the data is stored as high dimensional vectors, mathematical representations. The vector databases are designed to efficiently store and search high dimensional data by using graph embeddings. Embeddings are ideal for these fuzzy math match uh, problems and work with a variety of algorithms, which we talked about. Items that are near each other are considered similar. That's simply put. Vector databases need to be scalable for performance all the good things you want in a database, yeah, they gotta be there too, right? Many databases are also adding vector search functionality to their data cloud platform. If you're not using vectors already, you will be soon. Make sure your database provider can do it or, or the database you choose can do it. And it's likely depending upon the size of the organization, if it's large enough, even those of you who believe you're not using vectors already, it's likely that somewhere in your organization someone is playing with them. And this is an important technology being deployed against real production use cases every day already. And it's incumbent on your database infrastructure to be able to support this. So make sure it does as you go forward with vectors. And I believe I've left a few minutes for Q and A, Shannon. William, thank you so much for this great webinar. We've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm gonna get through as many as I can here. So. As we can't understand the content only floats, how do you see the evolution of the data quality controls and monitoring? Hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's sort of the foundational piece to all of this is to make sure that data is of sufficient quality to do all this. Now, we don't have the same data quality challenges that we did in the relational world where Frankly, every record was a, a contender to be a, to be a problem. Now, that's true in, in this world as well. Of course, the text could be wrong, but it's less true. And we're doing a little bit less caretaking around data quality for the data that goes into these vectors by design, but we're doing some. And I think doing none is, uh, is problematic and not going to get you anywhere. So you need to do a lot of spot checking of this data need to do it uh, from an expert basis uh, and make sure that it, it it continues to be fit for purpose. I still believe in uh, I still believe data governance should be covering this area uh, of the company as well. We're trying to make sure it does everywhere. So um, I don't know if there's a specific question around data quality or not, but yeah, it's still pretty important. Oh, very important. And, and the questioner, you know, it, it expanded that to the evolution, actually the evolution of all data management. Yeah, uh, this is part of the evolution of data management, right? You can't lose sight of all of the oldies but goodies. Um, and I say oldies, I mean things like, you know, stream processing and graph databases and things that some people don't even have, haven't even brought aboard yet. Uh, this may or may not be the appropriate next step in your data journey. That's for you to decide. Uh, you need to look at your problem set and what you have. And um, there's a point at which uh, you can keep going even with a subpar infrastructure. But if it's too subpar, you really need to, to do some remediation on that. And you really need to appropriately architect your new applications with this in mind. And I think that's uh, that last part is important because a lot of companies are doing kind of the same old. They're, they're trying to get to the finish line fast by not even thinking about the possibilities and just doing it the way that it always has been done. I believe that these new technologies, especially vector databases with them, that you can get there even faster than the way that you've, you've done the last 100 applications. It's that fast. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of times we're talking about things that you wouldn't even kind of want to be doing in the old way. So consider vector databases as you go forward. 
Oh, William, thank you so much. Uh, there's so many great questions here. Uh, I'll send them over to you and we'll see if we can get some answers to a lot of these. So lots of sure. questions and inquiries on vector databases and, and AI in general. So sure. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. Thank you all. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Really appreciate it. Uh, again, we'll try and get, I'll get those questions over to William because there's a lot of really good questions. Um, and uh, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. And thank you all. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, William. Bye-bye.